Jamie Wheel has made it his life's mission to crack the code of human potential. He's the best-selling author of Stealing Fire and director of the Flow Genome Project, which looks at how to harness the magic of flow states, those moments of being in the zone where we go beyond ourselves. I've always been interested in sort of the esoteric and the places where the sort of the mainstream meets the alternative. And what your book did really, really well was sort of reframe that as the cutting edge, which I thought was, was fascinating. Yeah, that was, a very, that was a deliberate decision we made, which was rather than saying, hey, esoteric techniques have some scientific validation now, we said, hey, Red Bull extreme athletes and special operations military guys are using it, and this is their secret sauce. And so we deliberately smuggled in esoterica into you know, undeniable peak performers that have a sort of a, a mainstream marketability and kind of halo effect, and then say, well, if they're doing it, you know, maybe you could, maybe you could, you know, wrap your head around it too. Because mm. in a way, this is kind of, like you say, stealing fire is referencing the idea that Prometheus steals fire from the gods. This is an eternal thing. Something, sure. th this is something that happens throughout culture. Can you explain that? A little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't presume to have an answer on it, but <laughs> it does seem that any time people pursue and cultivate and propagate ecstatic like technologies, just really anything that raises energy levels, enthusiasm, inspiration, all the way to transcendent and non-ordinary states via everything from dance and music to psychedelics, so substances, sexuality, um, even charismatic transmission, you know, a specific person or something that can sort of light other people up. Uh, it almost never ends well. <laughs> and, and so that recurring battle or dialectic between the sort of the priests, the, the keepers of society and, and inspiration and the Prometheans, the folks looking to steal it and put it out there for the masses. Uh, that just feels like a back and forth battle that's been going on for ages. And, and so um, why that is, is a whole, you know, that would be a life's work of inquiry. Uh, my sense is that it's just, it's, a, it's an unstable element. You know, that, that the ecstatic is not designed to um, build houses with. <laughs> it's designed to burn them down. Um, and so that, that very thing that makes it so magnetic and so appealing also renders it very volatile. Um, and then the other is just all the human stuff. You know, that when people latch onto this stuff, I mean, sex, drugs, money, power. You know, they all become places where we stumble as we try to bring this into culture. And it's very hard. It's the old Lord Acton, you know, absolute power corrupting absolutely. Um, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, the one ring. Mm. And, and it's not just hobbits, by the way, that are interested in that thing. Mm. Uh, so, so I'd say that, I mean, that's a, that's a broad brush, but we can, we, can, we can start with that. But you also say in the book that you think this, for the first time, it could end better than it has in the past. Yeah, and I just don't know. I mean, I mean, I wrote that somewhat optimistically two and a half years ago, uh, and then had an increasingly, an increasingly disillusioning series of experiences with the psychedelic polyamorous Burning Man community, let's say. So, so let's just say the intersection of sex, drugs, rock and roll, and, and, and libertarian ideals, and realized that those poor bastards can't get out of their own way mm. um, to even just build something like cryptocurrency. Mm. So, so my concern these days is that we are out of bullets. Like we've tapped, we have stolen fire from the gods. <laughs> we, we have absolutely taken ambrosia from Olympus. And what do you have, meaning? Well, just meaning the collective sort of, you know, quote unquote transformational culture. And that's everything from EDM and transformational festivals to the Burning Man world to Silicon Valley high tech space to um, psychedelic therapies to um, I would say anything other than just sort of MBSR mindfulness, so sort of actual mindfulness, mindfulness practices that still have some teeth and are actually still trying to get to non-dual states, not just help worker bees alleviate their stress and not call in sick so often. Um, and that we have access, yeah, to the most potent aggregation of transformational tools and technologies that any humans anywhere on this planet have ever had, and we're still crawling up our own asses into narcissistic feedback loops. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, the, the analogy these days is, you know, particularly, I mean, uh, well, I would say sort of psychedelic narcissism is creating um, the same way over-prescription of antibiotics created superflus. Uh, we are sort of over-prescribing ecstatic techniques and creating super-egos. 
So instead of eclipsing our senses of ourselves, um, there, there, there's, you know, 5% left and then you stop taking the medicine and then they come back stronger than ever. And so now we have people thinking that they are the second coming, think that they do have a hotline to divine intelligence, think they know, they do presume to say what the universe is about and how it operates, mm -hmm. think they can in fact sell and sell workshops and, and enroll, you know, um, punters online to follow them around. So, so we've ended up with a very problematic late stage issue, mm -hmm. which I never would have seen coming, which is the resurgence of egoic um, virulence in the midst of mm. transcendent technology. I actually posted something on Facebook the other day that Jordan Peterson has said, which was psychedelics can give you too much responsibility than you know what to deal with as well. Yeah, and I mean, even to phrase it that way implies that you're aware of the weight of it and mm. the responsibility of it. I think a lot of people, uh, James Fadiman, the, the fellow who was the pioneer of microdosing, um, I think he was on Tim Ferriss's podcast, and he used the analogy of, of overexposing film mm. and sort of you know let's say there's one exposure on a bit of celluloid and that's reality and then if you take a psychedelic that's another exposure so, th so that bit of film has more information but if you keep doing it if you do three four or five six times yes it has more information recorded on it but it's just a blurry mass mm. and the ability to separate signal from noise or transcendence from imminence or what the hell do I do on Monday or am I still an asshole to my family <laughs> those things get blurred out and so, you know, I think, I think what Jordan Peterson is cautioning about is almost a fairly advanced and relatively mature stage, mm. which is I've seen more than I can handle, but I acknowledge both of those things and, I'm, and I feel the weight. But, but I think there's a whole degree of, you know, lower levels of self-awareness where people are just getting lost in the fairy lights. Mm. You know, and there's sort of this cautions about that in a lot of mythological traditions, you know, whether it's sailors being seduced by the rapture of the deep and the mermaids and getting sort of going off to their doom or, you know, in the, in the sort of English tradition, the Celtic tradition, the, you know, the fairy lights in the forest mm -hmm. and being enchanted by them and wandering off into the woods never to be seen, seen again or come back in what only seemed like a minute and it's a lifetime, you know, away. I think those are the kinds of the cautions that we're facing sort of freshly now. I mean, there was all the train wrecks of the 60s yeah. and all the cautionary tales about just following your bliss and doing that. But we're coming back around to that point and going, hey, mm. wait a tick. Um, you know, there's maybe more going on. It's not just going to be instant, uh, instant liberation for all. Yeah, this is, again, fits very much with what I'm seeing at the moment. It's like we're, we're, we're in another level of enthusiasm about psychedelic science, for example. I've, I've done stories about psychedelic science. And as far as I can tell, most of the people who've done stories about psychedelic science so far are enthusiasts, because those are the journalists who are following these stories. They're the ones who are interested in it. Mm. And so what you're actually seeing is a very one-sided, again, a one-sided tale of psychedelic science, which is, is not showing the dangers that, you can, that, that they can create as well. Like psychedelics, for example, the, 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 the kind of metaphor or, or the paradigm at the moment is that you could do a couple of psychedelic sessions and overcome your depression. Whereas actually what you generally do is a couple of psychedelic sessions may just overwhelm you with the stuff that you haven't dealt with, mm -hmm. for example. So it's kind of this idea of the psychedelics as a magic pill is kind of now coming back in the culture, which just seems completely like we haven't learned anything from the 60s. Yeah, and it's being couched in the terms of better than Prozac, which it clearly is, <laughs> um, but, but certainly not a panacea. I mean, so in addition to the sort of psychedelic superflu idea, I also wrestle with uh, the notion of the sort of asym the asymptote problem. You know, the idea that, and we, you know, and, and we report on these as well. You know, the two to three episodes with therapeutic interventions and structured environments have these amazing and life-saving impacts for people suffering trauma and depression and, and, and end-of-life issues. And yet, you know, what happens when you take it from three to 33? And are people now levitating? Are they demigods? Are they Yodas? No, they're not. They're just candy flipping ravers. And so where, where is the, you know, where is the ROI and where should we actually say, that's probably enough. Um, and, and my sense is, is that there probably, there is highly, and, and you know, there's a degree of sort of libertarian enthusiasm, 
everyone should have access. These have been repressed and controlled for a long time. And now we're finally kind of coming out of the dark ages or coming out of prohibition. This is a renaissance. And I think there's a whole bunch of reasons to be enthusiastic and hopeful about that. Mm -hmm. And hat tip to MAPS and the folks that have been leading that charge, long, slow, difficult work, Robin Carhart, Harris, all, all the folks that are really doing the disciplined legwork for the rest of us. And I'm almost, you know, I, I'm sort of, sort of telegraphing ahead a few years, and I'm taking a stand probably now and increasingly clearly on um, regulation and restriction, and that in fact um, there's probably 10% of the population that should never touch the things. There's probably only 10% of the population that, that, sh that should encounter them more than one to three times in a lifetime. And there's a huge fat part of the bell curve that we should reestablish rites of passage. So imagine if and, you know, and obviously we know that confirmations and bar mitzvahs and all these things have just basically fallen flat and we end up with a bunch of rudderless humans um, wandering in between chapters of life, whether that's boomerang kids in their 20s or empty nesters or midlife crises or whatever they are, you know, or women in aging into their crone years, whatever it would be, we have shitty or non-existent rites of passage and what would it be like to simply program, yeah, three to five. There's a coming of age one where you go from child to man or woman uh, and that's, who knows, maybe that's a full visionary psychedelic. You know, that could be a, you know, a... So Eleusinian mystery style. An Eleusi and yeah, an Eleusinian mystery, like, this is the nature of the world, welcome to it. Uh, and then perhaps there could be a marriage one, and that, you know, you could, you could calibrate the compounds or substances that are most appropriate. So clearly some form of MDMA therapeutic communion could be a beautiful thing. This is the essential nature of your love together. You know, there could be something either at death or in preparing for death or in other, you know, life transitions. But in general, my sense is if we're gonna try and play the long game with this stuff and integrate it back into culture, there were no indigenous cultures that were just gloves off, have at it, kids. <laughs> and that's how we're doing it these days. And, and so there's a, actually, there's, in fact, I don't know if you've come across Richard Rudgley's stuff out of mm -hmm. Oxford. He wrote a really cool book called Essential Substances. And it was basically an anthropological, it was basically like Yuval Harari on acid. Um, so it was, it was essential substances through all of human history and culture. But there was a, a tribe from New Guinea um, who basically had nine levels of initiation. And it started with ginger. So there were three levels of ginger, and then three levels of tobacco, and then three levels of mushrooms. And each level became fewer and fewer people invited into that level until by the ninth level, which was the highest octane psychedelic mushrooms, um, basically whatever visions came out of that, and that was literally the equivalent of like a PhD in the spiritual practice of their culture, but whatever came through in those visions was then considered living scripture and added to their equivalent of the Bible. So rather than burning those fuckers at the stake, like the Christian tradition did, like, no, 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 no one gets to have any more insights. It was a living tradition, but it was also hierarchical and selective. So once you were introduced into a substance at the level you were initiated, you had free, free range and access, but you weren't allowed to jump the gun and try stuff that you had no business trying yet. And so when we see the advent of DMT and 5-MeO-DMT and all these absolute paint-peeling entheogens being dabbled in by absolutely clueless twits, um, I think that that's, you know, that would probably be good lessons for us, mm -hmm. is let's actually start putting some structures back in the place versus just saying this is going to be a free-for-all that works out well, because they tend not to. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you've gone on a real journey since releasing Stealing Fire to where you're at now. Well, in, in what way? What, what, what were you curious about? You, you said you're, you're less enthusiastic about the potential mm -hmm. of, is it only of the potential of psychedelics, or have, have, have your views changed in any other way? No, shit, man. I mean, look at the, look at the Wim Hof... Um, Groupy phenomenon. I mean, people don't know what to do with that stuff. Uh, a good friend of ours has uh, actually been was with, was the one responsible for bringing him into you know high end neuroscience labs in the first place, and was like, half of this is bullshit, half of this works. He doesn't know which is which, and you've got all these folks l plunging themselves into inflatable kiddie pools just to feel something, just to feel high. So you can throw in respiration, you can throw in any form of quote unquote conscious sexuality, the, po the polyamory movement, which is, you know, everything from sex at dawn to um, God knows what, I mean, the varying books, you know, even Esther Perel's work, which she's coming from a very grounded therapeutic space, but sort of gives permission for more expansive and exploratory sexuality. Um, that, there's a lot of that that's wildly problematic. Um, so really, I would say anytime you have a, a persistent and, and efficacious technique of ecstasy, abstracted from cultural conditions and prohibitions, thou shalt and thou shalt not, here's how to use this powerful tool, 
we end up with shit shows. And now we're end up with intersectional shit shows. So you throw in, as I said, sort of a you know, polyamorous, state-seeking, psychedelic, friendly, Burning Man or transformational festival culture, which is sort of around the world at this point. And no boundaries, basically. No boundaries. Nobody tells me what to do. So it's antinomian. There is nothing I bow down to. And, and, and in fact, and there's, and there's not necessarily a higher good than my personal fulfillment in this moment. And, and that create, and as long as I engage in nonviolent communication, as long as I share my feelings and state my needs, all that stuff, then it should all be fine, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm honestly not sure that is. And I'm also not sure that, again, back to asymptotes, that the, that's why we kind of share the idea of like 80, 20, woke to broke, is, is pursuing that last 20% of your supposed enlightenment or fulfillment or personal growth actually becomes highly narcissistic and almost unconscionable when you think that that's going to take 80%, like you, you get, you know, you get 80% of the return for your initial 20% of your investment in personal growth, I would advocate. I mean, this at least is a thought experiment, but people don't stop there. They get hooked on the catharsis, they get hooked on the ecstasis, they get hooked on the communitas. They like, oh, it feels so good to break down and break through. It feels so awesome to touch the sun and it feels so amazing to be around my brothers and sisters, my tribe. You know, and, so, and, and yet they'll then spend 80% more time, effort, money, resources chasing the, um, chasing the uncatchable of their own completion and some story or tale that when I get there, I will be free from pain, I will be free from insecurity, anxiety, you know, poverty, you name it. I will be whole and life will be perfect. And it's like, no, mm. fuck you, that's not how life works. Mm. And in the meantime, you're blowing 80% of those energy credits on yourself when you already know enough Tell as to what you've got to do, and there's people drowning behind you. So lifting those folks up is going to provide infinitely more net good than polishing, you know, polishing the last little corner you know, on your statue. But there is also the, the sense that that polishing the last little corner is actually an illusion. Uh -huh. that, yeah. That's not human. Yeah. We're, exactly. we're, we're trying to transcend being human, and we can't transcend being human. Exactly. So like embrace it, and that's where spiritual teachers like Pema Chodron, you know, a Tibetan Buddhist who's very much into, I mean, we, we even ended a bit of stealing fire with that. You know, there's a crack in everything. Mm -hmm. and, and embracing our humanity, embracing the messy imperfections of this. And it's not, I mean, and you should have, I, I'm hesitant to say the other half of the sentence because it becomes so glib, but the idea of like, th therein lies the actual root to wholeness and realization. It's not continuing to climb the mountain. It's the, it's the you know, Zen oxiding parable, like returning you know, to the village with helping hands. Mm. And the idea that it's all still about me and my process mm. and my journey, you know, sort of fuck your journey. <laughs> and, I th and I think that that kind of loving backhand is something that this extended movement needs much more of. Which is if you're not if you're not making the world materially better, and if you're not serving uh, harder done by folks than you, then Instagram photos of your hashtag blessed life, you know, you can just fuck off with them because that's not it's never been the point. And the only humans that have ever had access to these tools and techniques have generally been within martial and monastic traditions. And there's always been a code and an ethics and a and a point as to why you would even have access to them in the first place. And I mean, a lot of this sounds quite Jordan Peterson-esque. What's your attitude to Jordan Peterson? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad he's out there. Um, and I think there are, you know, I mean, I think at a minimum, there's sort of three different Jordan Petersons. You know, there's Jordan Peterson, the analyst and academic, which virtually nobody ever heard of. There's Jordan Peterson, the kind of contrarian public intellectual, which sort of, you know, kicked off in 2016. Um, and then there's sort of Jordan Peterson, sort of Rorschach blot for the culture wars, of which both left and right wildly distort who he is, what he's saying, and what it, and ha and what it means for them. And so we get, we get the, the second and the third ones completely mixed, although the first one, you know, University of Toronto and you know, former Harvard professor is the one that gives the credibility and the weight to the other two dialogues. So in that respect, um, I think as a, as, as what I imagine him to be as an actual man is a pretty high integrity principled person who likes to think for himself and likes to speak not just truth to power, but, but also likes to um, remind his audience, whether it's students or, or broader than that, um, what, what, is, you know, what, is a, what is a life well, a good life well lived. Um, and now there, I think there are, there are problems in how in the age of sound bites and 
hundreds of hours of footage and tons of speaking and those kind of things that become problematic. And I'm not in any way convinced that if I sat down with him and said, hey, mate, what about this bit, that he would actually stand and defend them. But impressions I get would be that his, um, I think he sometimes over catastrophizes the slippery slope to Marxism. Uh, in the sense of that, that all the, you know, this way lies Stalinist death camps, therefore we cannot give one inch on, on um, concessions to progressive ideals or agendas. Although, having said that, I have also personally experienced the almost Chinese communist like Tom Zing struggle sessions of political correctness in, in the academy and in kind of left wing, you know, left coast. Um, idea. So it's not that I don't see the peril, I do. I just think sometimes he uses the slippery slope argument. Maybe he, I think he pulls it out just sometimes a little early is the bottom line without necessarily enough conditions to justify it. He sometimes, um, in my experience, I think I remember him on Joe Rogan doing the life is nasty, brutish and short, the kind of Hobbesian it's always been this way. Therefore, any efforts to try and recalibrate or rebalance the scales are fundamentally flawed, delusional, and by the way, lead to the Stalinist death camps um, without any more nuanced socio-political critique of practices and policies. So for instance, concentration of wealth in the 1% and even the percent of the 1% um, has been directly traceable in, at least in the U.S., over you know, ta tax and tax and corporate law, uh, various various deliberate policies that are fundamentally different than the '70s and '80s, and have now resulted in an incredible skewing, and aggregation of wealth in the hands of the few. For him to skip over that and go to lobsters and serotonin feels like skipping some critical steps, and also skipping some critical places of potential responsibility. Um, Let's think there's, there's a couple more. There would be another one would just be where, it, where is his insight coming from? And so we talk, you know, you, when you were describing, hey, you almost sound a little bit like Jordan Peterson. I mean, in the sense of, yeah, I, I mean, if I had to describe my worldview in a nutshell, it would be sort of a Neoplatonic, so there was a you know, Neoplatonic, Stoic, um, mystic, Christic, Gnostic. So the idea of Neoplatonic, I believe, I have always just sort of felt like there is a, a realm of ideal forms. Mm. Stoic, do the suck it up fat kid and do the hard thing, 100%. Um, Gnostic, there is a certain ineffable experience of being. And then the mystic Christic is some, some reflection on the Judeo-Christian Western tradition, but n nothing to do with 2,000 years of bureaucratic administration and everything to do with what is nominally the metaphor of Kairos and Kronos, the intersection of kind of sacred and, and profane time in human form. Mm. Um, so in that respect, yeah, um, I would track with, with Peterson. My sense is for me, um, my you know, gnosis or understanding um, has come from ecstasis, has come from um, peak experiences. Um, and my sense for him, at least as he shares what he does of his life, has come from catharsis. It's come from the suffering. It's come from um, battling depression. It's come from staring the abyss in the face versus the view from the summit. And those are ideally come full circle and reinforce each other. But if I had to sort of delineate maybe where is his transmission anchoring from, it's maybe a little bit more the staring the abyss and, and, and surviving it than, uh, than calling out coordinates from the mountaintop. Interesting. And I guess you've seen the whole intellectual dark web concept sort of grow and become kind of mainstream. Yeah. I mean, that we, interestingly, the, the Glitch in the Matrix documentary I put out was subtitled Intellectual Dark Web, Jordan Peterson and the Mainstream Media mm. two months ago. And then the New York Times mm -hmm. did a profile on it. And then yeah. we published something said, that said the intellectual dark web is dead. Because you guys did. Yeah, uh -huh. because as soon as the New York Times publicizes something on it, then there is no intellectual dark web. It is now mainstream. So I, I was actually in the process of, of kind of putting together an intellectual dark web documentary. And then off the back of that, we kind of had a th thought about it and realized that for me, the intellectual dark web, so you've got kind of like Dave Rubin, the Weinsteins, um, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, then I realized, I was start, sort of starting to think about what is a deeper resolution? Like th that, that seems to me like a really important stage mm -hmm. of, of, of surfacing this kind of level of conversation, an integral conversation or something on yeah. that's emerging naturally. 
and then we came up with the concept of the intellectual deep web. Uh -huh. So what are the and what are the knowledge? What is the knowledge that that needs to be integrated? And I came up with names like Stan Groff, Richard Tarnas, mm -hmm. and I would also add your work into that. What do you what do you think about that as an idea of there are thinkers who've been who who've who've been doing really great work. Do you know Richard Tarnas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, who've been doing re really great work on the fringes of our culture for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. And I, personally, I think these are the people we need to integrate to get us through the next mm -hmm. five, ten years. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a, a neat distinction you're making. And I think I, I, I just read a piece in Box, I think, this morning, which was basically, it, was, it was felt a little snarky, and it was basically saying that the internet, and it was a response to the New York Times piece, and it was basically saying, oh, the intellectual dark web are just a bunch of embittered losers on the, on the, on the outs. And, and, and effectively, they've been marginalized by the people who should have marginalized them. And they're really just angry because they've been, they've been sort of knocked off their perch or denied a platform. And that, that's just, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I bet we could do actually an, an a data an analysis of this. Mm -hmm. My sense of Jordan, of Sam Harris, of these guys is, is not that they are embittered and on the outside banging on the door. They've just done, a, done an end run mm -hmm. and their actual reach is infinitely greater then, I mean, just retweets, views, clicks, likes, shares, you name it, any, any social stat you would want to track. Um, my sense is that their reach is, is, ex is exploding massively. Um, not that, they, that they've been sort of shut out from the chattering classes. Um, so I, th I think there's, there are very, there are, and back to the Rorschach block idea, there was this sense of these guys are saying, saying the unconscionable and should be shunned. Um, so the intellectual deep web uh, is, I mean, it doesn't quite have the mystery of the dark web, but, but as far as like the distinctions of concepts, I think it's really neat. And we are, we kind of saw this in the 2016 election, both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump did end runs around the Democratic and DNC and the RNC. And they said, if we can reach our people via our own distributed economic platforms. We are no longer beholden to the donor class. We are no longer beholden to established and entrenched you know, um, political platforms uh, and choice making. And we can just and we can make we can amplify via the democratic system our impacts and our reach. And you see that with musical artists these days. You see that, I mean, even hell, even with yoga teachers, if you've got a big following on Instagram and you don't need to kowtow to some lineage, which, you know, has lots of problems as well, because all of the vetting of the light web, you know, of the establishment, um, did have a solid degree of quality control to it. Um, so you tended not to get absolute howlingly bad or irresponsible folks showing up in that space, but you also missed a shit ton of innovation. So, you know, to your query of is, is the access to the intellectual deep web something that is going to be helpful in guiding our way forward? My, my, my I, I would, I would go as far as saying that would be like my only hope for a kind of glorious revolution versus a, a bloody reign of terror. If we can simply, if the people and the ideas and then the actions can just do an end run around the established balances of power, um, and again, you know, Bernie would be an example. Like, what is a true progressive centrist who is, you know, socially progressive and fiscally conservative? And internationally, um, I, would, I wouldn't say pacifist, but certainly just ethical mm -hmm. and globally concerned with interconnected issues like climate, like refugees, et cetera. How many people would sign up for that? I think a lot. Mm -hmm. I think a lot. I don't. I mean, I think there would be. A, you, you would just forget third-party candidates. You would just end up with an uprising, and the two existing parties would be left, you know, holding their dicks. So the question becomes: um, How do we do more of that? Uh, and, and how do we and how do we provide enough of a clarion call um, that people can reorient around those things? You talked in your talk before; it sounded quite pessimistic or almost quite apocalyptic about what might be about to come. Hmm. Are you are you pessimistic or optimistic? <laughs> I would say I am highly pessimistic of human culture and optimistic of human nature, and that's about that's about as. Uh, precise as I can get because if I if you if you run the maps and models and you see I mean the thing that blows me away about identity politics these days is you know we have some things to do people <laughs> and if we are quibbling and scrapping before we even get to the starting line of the race for our lives we're fucked and so you know as of last summer I went from 
well, I mean, that was, you know, you know the stealing fire had just come out. There was all sorts of interesting conversations and that kind of thing. And then I would say I had a fairly, you know, not, dare I say it, it was my, the equivalent of my red pilling, where I was like, brr, 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 okay, whoa. Um, I thought that generally everybody left of white identity politics was fundamentally a sound and solid human being, and we were all rowing in the same direction, and realized, oh, no, you can actually be kneecapped with a degree of virulence and spite and entitlement from the left that shouldn't, by all accounts, live there, and t seems to be. So in that respect, I literally went from, oh, we're going to save the world via blockchain and distributed decentralized or autonomous organizations, yay, whew, just that was close, uh, to nope, 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 even those fuckers can't figure it out either, and I should dig the well in my new house in the mountains 400 feet deep, not 200 feet deep. <laughs> And definitely, let's get a Tesla Powerwall and be off the grid. So mentally, <laughs> that's where I've been. Which doesn't mean I'm not going to keep fighting the good fight. It just means I'm absolutely planning the rear guard action and the lifeboats for the people I care about the most so I can stay engaged to the last possible minute. And what do you think are the either ideas or thinkers or practices that we need to integrate to get through the next sort of five, ten years? Mm -hmm. Gosh. Um, well, I mean, I, th I think... The, you know, the simplest is to say we need a lot of credible, thoughtful voices from significantly different points of view and perspective. So I don't always agree with Sam Harris, but I appreciate he's out there and I appreciate he thinks the way he thinks. I don't always agree with Jordan Peterson. I don't always agree with Yuval Harari, but I like the fact that they're doing their thing. So I think that there's a significant component of that, that we just need a bunch of credible, thoughtful, informed people bringing their voices as skillfully um, uh, and visibly to the problems at hand as we possibly can. Um, I feel, I mean, again, to just restate um, Pema Chodron, some folks like her, of her ilk, people who are expressing the human condition not as an uh, infinite escalator of successes and perfectibilities, but hey, here we are, this is, this is, this is blending heaven and earth. You know, and, and this is what it means to be um, woke and broke. And can we celebrate that? Um, those are the kinds of things that leave me. Those are about, I would say that's about the only place I feel hope. I feel hope when people come together in their mortality and their humanity, and then something beautiful happens. So it's the true kind of redemption songs, you know, idea. It's, it's gospel music. It's those elements where we're like, oh my God, I was weeping last night, but here we are giving praise, here we are singing beautifully, here we are dancing and clapping and stomping, like that's kind of it. And everything shy of that to me feels um, either, you know, less deep than it might need to be, um, or problematic, you know, no matter how flashy or sexy it seems at the moment, problematic and destined to fail at a later date with more consequences. I get the sense that the journey we're going to have to go on is actually um, a, a much deeper one than just the intellectual one. Oh, it's going okay. to be like we all have to integrate and process and and, and go through stuff. Like, like I feel that we're almost inevitably going to have our own crisis points and need to work through stuff yeah. over the next few years. What does that look like, do you think? <sighs> um, I mean, I think it's basically you can either use ecstasis or we will be served up catharsis. So it'll either be the peak experience that renders people to have a global centric perspective and then come down, you know, come down from the mountain with helping hands. Oh shit, I got it. I got the message and here's the work to do and I'm going to conduct it with the urgency that my long range vision tells me is potentially prudent. If we ignore that, it seems like most of us are, including the people that are getting lots of time up at the top of the mountains. If we ignore that, then we will experience enough pain and lesser until that wakes us up instead. And what degree of cultural collapse, destruction, tension um, needs to occur or will occur in order, for, in order for us to get to that spot, who knows? But that's where I'm not wildly comfortable. Like, that's where I'm, I, I would say at a minimum, deeply concerned because um, the notion that even the things that are potentially helping us these days, like ecstatic techniques, culture, and practices, um, unplugging nature retreats, you, you, you name it. I mean, but the classic cliches is, you know, let's go to Costa Rica or Mexico or Nicaragua and do yoga and ayahuasca and, and talk about our feelings. 
and, even, and unplug from our phone. But even those things are being then sold, commodified, refracted through Instagram posts and through social media. And so even when people, I mean, I just read an article today on how basically Instagram culture is creating a huge spike in fatalities in Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks because people are going there, they're shooting, oh, here I am shimmying along this knife ridge, it's this awesome rad shot, look at me, I did it. And then other people are de-risking the process. And there's one mountain near Aspen where, where five people died in six weeks. And that's, that's analogous, that high territory, which then seems safe and approachable, is just no different than hearing Joe Rogan on a podcast. I mean, how many CrossFit MMA guys are now hitting DMT because they're like, Joe said, I said it was cool. You know, you're having these kinds of experiences and even the things that are potentially our salvation are becoming commodified, refracted, and distorted by the very tools we're actually trying to get away from with those new solutions. So in that respect, we've almost trussed ourselves up with no escape, and that one baffles me. You, know. you said you go to the top of the message, or sorry, you, you go to the top of the mountain, you get the message, what's the message? Um, I mean, it's impossible to state it succinctly without it being cliche, but I, I would say stay awake and build stuff, you know? Uh, do the hard thing, above all be kind, that's Huxley's bit, you know? I mean, that's more than enough to start with. You did, at the end of your talk, say that you thought we might get it together just in time. Yeah, well, funnily enough, like that, that's, to me, that, that phrase actually was a little bit of an incantation. So it's not even just in time, like in the nick kind of thing. Um, it's maybe in chronos, in linear, mundane time, um, and that we might get it together, I suppose, at that intersection of Kairos and Kronos. You know, that if we can anchor ourselves in that, in sacred time, where past, present, and future are all co-arising and nothing needs to be done, and we can have faith in the fact that, in fact, this does work out. And, and I don't mean faith in the sort of, sort of blind hope, I mean like actual Gnostic initiatory certainty, that we have seen how this all goes down and light prevails. Then, um, then we can come back to our day-to-day -day lives. And to me, that you, know, you mentioned the, the Lucinian mysteries. Like to me, if we could initiate or have as many people around the planet initiate themselves as possible into that knowing that, hey, this all works out. All we need is 51% goodness, truth, and beauty over the long arc of this whole game. It doesn't matter how dark the varying chapters get. If we know we've, we've seen the resolution, we've seen the redemption, then we come back and we're like, hey, everybody, it's all going to work out. We can exhale. Now, that doesn't mean there's not hard shit. It doesn't mean there's not critical shit. It doesn't mean there's not, and my part isn't absolutely required in me to play it balls deep, you know, because it's only 51%. So I don't get to phone it in just because I saw how the film ends. We're all required. And, and to me, that's what I actually have hope in, is that if, if enough people can come to that realization, then, then we wake up, and not in some bullshit evangelical megachurch, kind of way of being born again, but in a, in a truly initiatory way, being born again of like, I know my purpose, I know my part, and I'm willing to practice resurrection. I'm willing to offer my life fully and freely, in love, in every moment, and, and if needs be, um, in the face of injustice, and if needs be, in service of the things I cherish. And then we're invincible. Like, then we can turn things on a dime. Um, if we do this incrementally, if we get hung up around identity politics, if we imagine that technological progressivism will save us at last. I mean, I think there's an all sorts of problems on that. Um, but if there is a chance to do it, I, you know, ironically, out of time, in, in that sacred space, then we have a chance to do it in time, you know, while the clock is ticking. Yeah. The people that I've found who've, who've done the most or seem to have got at least far enough down the path are those who've been through a sort of transformational community. Mm. Like the, the guy who has our, who's our mentor, uh -huh. a guy called Raffia, was part of the Osho community for many years, uh -huh. which was sort of experimenting with all of these kind of transformational yeah. technologies. Yeah. But they were doing it within a community of people for two decades who were all, ref who were all doing the same thing, reflecting stuff back. Yeah. And it, took, it seems to have taken that level of intensity and reflection and shared purpose for them to have, have done the transformations that they have. Mm -hmm. 
like they're, they're almost no like it, it seems striking to me like how much work we seem to have to do to get to that place <laughs> does, does that make sense yeah. like it, that, that sort of reflects back to what you were saying about sort of the psychedelic communities it's like it, it's not the it's not the transcendence it's the deep interpersonal work yeah. that, that we have to do of, of intense interpersonal work with with communities like I, th I think we have to build that kind of community yeah for sure and that you know the catharsis plus communitas is another cul-de-sac I mean we know a number of communities that are very deeply into um, raw intimate intersubjective communication and a everybody ends up banging everybody and there's tons of drama around that and then B everybody you know if I can just getting your lunch takes an hour and a half because everyone's sharing how they're feeling in the moment and you're like okay that too is a necessary but not sufficient criterion mm -hmm. and and that sense of um, you know back to the 8020 I think what traps so many of the people who are into process based communities is that they get the cathartic hit for the first you know they and, and that's 80 percent of the of, with their 20 percent investment but they hang on and they keep going back to ring the same bell and ring the same bell. it's like no of course we need to be able to be aware of our feelings and of course we need to be able to process stuff and stay as clear as possible and of course we sometimes need to check in with infinites and absolutes just to make sure our, we're keeping time and then there's that element of integration and service purpose yeah let's go the whole stay awake build stuff like if we're not if we're not doing those two things in concert then the just staying awake just becomes an exercise it's fiddling while Rome burns mm. and if we're just building stuff but we've lost connection to the one then we might be we might build wonky lopsided stuff that doesn't doesn't stand the time mm.